Welcome once again to our family service. If this is your first visit with us, we especially warmly welcome you and, and trust that this will be uh, the first visit of many. I was recently thinking about those of us who came to know Christ, who became Christians, um, and how we were introduced to the ABC of the Gospel, as one preacher has recently put it. A standing for admitting that we are sinners, that we've done wrong, all of us, no exceptions, that B, we came to believe in Christ, that he paid for our sin in death and blood on the cross, that without this, no one will see God, and indeed, well, ominously, we will face a lost eternity in his absence. And then C, and importantly, counting the cost. We would have to repent. We would have to turn from our ways, our selfish ways of doing things, and live according to Jesus' ways, that his will would become our will. And we might spend a lifetime um, trying to achieve this heady um, goal, to turn away from the things that we once thought were good. Many years the Apostle ago, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Romans uh, and in chapter 12 he put our service this way. I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living holy sacrifice acceptable unto God. How could we do such a thing? How could we turn from a lifetime of habit of serving ourselves? of living for wealth, for example, for material acquisition. How can we turn from these ways? Uh, a, a, a rich young ruler once came to Jesus and fell at his knees and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, one thing you lack, go sell all your possessions and come and follow me. And the story recalls how sorry the young man was, but he couldn't do that and tragically turned away. His disciples asked him, well, how can this happen? How can we, basically they were asking, how can we live such a life of dedication? And Jesus said, with man it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. With God's help, with God's strength. And this has been the testimony of Christians ever since. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Well, this happens to be a theme, the message that we're going to hear a bit later on, at least if I'm not very much mistaken. So before we begin, let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that you give strength. We thank you, Father, especially this week, that you are also the God of all comfort and you draw near to those who mourn. We pray, Father, that you will do that uh, in our locality, in our own domestic circumstances at our church, but also across the world. We pray for those in other parts of the world who've suffered loss, especially those who suffered loss through persecution in northern Nigeria, in North Korea, in Eritrea, and so many other places, Father, where those are mourning the death of loved ones. We pray that you would draw near to them and draw near to us, Father, as we um, move into our service this morning. Let what we hear and what we sing be to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign. Bye. 
The rich and the kingdom of God. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you honour your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Good morning. Uh, we now come to the part of the service called the children's spot. It is the harvest festival at church this morning, or it was the harvest festival at church this morning, depending on when you're viewing this. So I thought I would tell you my favourite 
Harvest Children's Story. In fact, it is my only Harvest Children's Story, but I do like it. And the story is about one of these. That's correct. They're beans. And in this particular story, we're looking at a bean called Jimmy. And as many of you rightly recognised, he is a runner bean. Now, Jimmy lived in a beautiful garden. There were flowers, there were shrubs, there were trees, there were areas with fruit and vegetable, and it was all looked after by the gardener. So one day, Jimmy went to the gardener and he asked, what should I do? How do I fit into the plans that you have for this garden? Now, the gardener knew Jimmy. He was expecting him and he took him to a specially prepared hole in the ground. Pop in there and I'll bury you, said the gardener. Now Jimmy looked at the hole in the ground and he looked around at the garden and frankly he wasn't too keen on the idea. And the gardener didn't force him, he simply said come back if you change your mind. So Jimmy wandered the garden but it wasn't as much fun as he had hoped. The sun came out, but Jimmy had no leaves, so he just got hot. And the rain came down, but Jimmy had no roots, so he just got wet. And the insects came out, but Jimmy had no flowers, so he just got ignored. After a time, he went back to the garden and a little reluctantly, he climbed into the hole. But the gardener did not forget about it. He put a bit of compost onto the soil if that was needed, some water if it got too dry, and he provided a long straight stick. And in no time at all, Jimmy grew and grew and grew. Roots to soak up the rain, leaves to enjoy the sunshine, and flowers to attract the insects. And he grew very very tall. I remember as a boy my father had two lots of runner beans that would grow up huge uh, sticks and you could go between the two of them if you were small enough. Anyway, like many good stories this one has a lesson. We are like Jimmy. We are beans. Human beans. It's a slight pun there. Uh, and God is the gardener. He created us he is in charge of where we live. He knows each one of us and he knows what's best for us. And he has a plan, a place for each one of us in his garden. But we can do our own thing. We can go our own way. Maybe God's plan does not seem like fun. And he will never force us to do his will. But... If we want to be truly happy, content, complete, satisfied, if we want to be people that are all we were meant to be, then we have to trust the gardener. We have to follow his plan because he knows best. It's his garden and he will look after us. He will never leave us or forsake us and we will grow up in him to be everything we should be be. In every being there is tremendous potential and as God said in one of the better known verses in the Bible, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Lillian. Um, I've been asked to share my testimony, which I'm really happy to do that because I've been really wanting to express my thanks to God and um, to express how faith is important. Um, my testimony I'm going to share is about how I was I was living with um, with my son, and I'm still living with him, and um, we are living in a two-bedroom property. So I had a friend of mine who called me that he needs help because he's struggling financially. 
so he needs a place to live for the short while to adjust himself with his girlfriend so they used to live at south london so i said that's fine so they came and joined me in my two bedroom property with my son so we shared the property so he was giving me something and i was paying more of the rent so what i did i emailed my landlord and i said i've got someone living with me and this is how much he's giving me i put the exact amount and i said this is how much i'm paying to the rent and he would like his name to be in the tenancy agreement so the landlord put his name in the tenancy agreement under his name with my one so we had a joint tenancy i paid more because the girlfriend was not working and then she was pregnant as well so what happened is that during the course of us staying together we had an agreement that they'll stay for at least six months to one year that was the maximum and then they have to move out by that time they must have adjusted themselves financially and everything will be okay with other things that they had that they had to sort out so when it was about that period one year because we sent an email to the landlord as well the estate agent that is the period they're moving out so the agent now emailed us and said okay now i'm giving a new tenancy to lillian without his name and they were cool with that and because that's what we already agreed then they signed sent me a new tenancy which i signed with my name only because they were moving out now they were looking for the property after a while, the landlord now, two weeks after landlord, after issuing me a tenancy without his name, when I knew they were moving out already, then the landlord emailed me another tenancy. Two weeks of issuing me a new one and said, oh, I need to sign this with his name on it. So I thought it was a mistake because I just signed one two weeks ago with my name based on our agreement and the fact that they moved. So I called the landlord and the landlord said to me, no, he has emailed them and said that he has changed his mind. They're not going anywhere. And they thought he has called me to discuss with me that he's not going anywhere. And I agreed before they decided to issue the new tenancy. And I said, no, I only heard from them that he's changed his mind. He's not said anything to me. We're living in the house. We had no issues. I told them as family. You know, these are friends. I've treated them as my own family and we discuss without any problem. I'm always open and communicate with them. So I asked them, I said, this is what the landlord has told me. Is that true? And they say, yeah. And I said to the guy, okay, this is the same thing, yeah? This was the agreement, you need to move out because I need my space with my son. And the guy said to me, I'm not going anywhere. That's how he responded to me. And I said, okay, in that case, still let me see because it is in my name now, so you need to move out. He said, he's not going anywhere. That was all he responded. Nothing, no adding of anything or no asking or requesting or whatever. So I said, that's fine. The next day, the girlfriend came to me and kneeled down in front of me and said, please, Lillian, help us. We are struggling financially. We've looked for properties and it's not easy to get one. It's very expensive and we cannot afford at the moment. And he said, you see my child? My child will be on the street. What will you think and how will you feel if you throw that child in the street? Please help us. And I said, okay, I can give you guys three months to sort yourself out. The guy said three months is not enough. I said six months is not enough. And then he said to me one year will be better. And I said, okay, I'll have a think about it. I thought of it, I reflected, and I said, okay, it will not be good to throw a child like this on the street or to kick people out. So I said to them, because of the child, I'll let you guys stay. I gave them one year, and I called my landlord, and I said, okay, I've decided. I had a word with them, and uh, I'll let them stay for another year. So I'm happy to go on and sign the one-year tenancy. So I signed again, I resigned the tenancy. So now we're having a joint tenancy, myself with the guy's name on it. I got him to stay for one year and move out. So when the one year was about to elapse, then now the landlord now emailed asking as agreed, are we going forward? Like I'm having a tenancy on my own and they're moving out. And then he responded to the landlord, not even to me, and said to the landlord that nothing has changed and they are not going anywhere. So I emailed the landlord, copying him in the email and said, as it was agreed, they are moving out and I'm staying with my son. And um, the landlord said, no, he has said that he's not going anywhere, nothing has changed. And forwarded me the email. That day I was in the office. I was crying. I had anxiety. Everything. I was all over the place that very day. You know, something when something like that happens to you, immediately that panic and everything and stress. You don't even think of even praying that time. That's what happened to me. I got stressed. I didn't even know. I was shaking, crying. I was everything all over the place. I even remember one of my manager came to me and said, oh, Lillian, which man has broken your heart? And I said, I wish it was a man that had broken my heart. It's far more than that. And he's like, can you talk to me? And I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. Just just leave me alone. And he walked away. I gathered myself. 
took my laptop, put in my bag, and I went home. I could not continue to work. It was in the afternoon about 3 p.m. I just packed my things and I left. And then when I came home, I was coming home thinking, they're going to be, I'm, I'll be entering the house and they're going to be talking about it to me. Explaining that this what happened, nothing. They didn't even utter a word. So as I got home, I decided to pray. That's that time I was calm now. I prayed. I entered my room, I prayed. And I said, God, calm me down. Guide me and direct me what to do. And as I prayed, I felt a bit of calm. I really felt that calmness in me. That lot of anxiety and too much stress that was like, attack them, talk to them, you know, confront them. Everything died down. Maybe that thing could have even brought us more problems. And I decided not to even say anything. So what I did now, um, I spoke to my manager about what has happened. I spoke to my son's school. Um, and I said, this is what has happened. But before speaking to them, I sent an email to my estate agent. And I said, based on what he has said, that he's not going anywhere. I copied the guy in the email. I explained our agreement and what has happened in the past. And I said, I gave them this opportunity and this is what they have decided to do. And I said, for that reason, I need my peace. I need my space with my son. It's important for our mental health. It's important for us to have our own space. And we decided to move out from the property. And let the landlord take that as my not notice and give the property to them. So um, the landlord said to me, oh, I've been a very great tenant. They would like to keep me in the property, you know. And I said, even if you keep me in the property and evict them, it's, I work with housing, so I know how long it will take to evict people, you know. It's not easy to get eviction now because of the backlog in the court and that eviction process. I don't want to wait for that long. It means I'm going to stay another one year or even more with them. So I said, I'm going to look. I know it's going to take long. I don't know how it's going to be. I didn't plan for this or prepare for this, but I know there will be a way out. And it was my faith telling me that time now that you know what, maybe this is the time for you to move on. So I started looking for property, looking left and right. I found, and then now they called me. I've already viewed different properties, you know. And then my landlord called me, my agent, and said, We've got a property, one of our own landlord. You might want to have a look. I went and viewed that property, and I just loved that property straight away. But there were people outside who also came to view that property, they love it. But they called me and they said, Because you are our tenant, we love you, you're really nice, and you've been a good tenant, we never had issues with you. Would like to give it to you. The landlord expected me to get a guarantor and a certain amount of money, but with me, what they said to the um, they told the landlord, the landlord was like, From what you guys have said to me about this tenant, Libyan, I am happy not to request for any guarantor or any fees or anything. Just bring the, do the necessary paperwork for her to sign and then move in. And she just needs to pay her one more rent and deposit. I didn't even plan financially, but I know God is going to show a way for me to pay that money. But guess what? My manager and my manager's manager called me in a meeting and they said, when you told us about that problem, we thought about it. You've been working so hard for us. You know, you've done so well and the way you meet our team, what it is today. And we think as colleagues, we need to support you and your manager. So they paid for my one more and deposit. They paid directly to my landlord, my agent. And I secured this property that I am in with my son. And we left those other people and I know it's the fit. The school came that time and they come and they said, if you need a solicitor, we're happy to help and get you one to go take those people to court. And I said, no, I'm not telling them to court. I've decided to, to just move forward. You know, I came to church. I spoke to some members of the church and I'm really grateful. I had so much support, advice. And I'm just so thankful to Lincoln Road Chapel, the Christians, everybody in there. Everyone has been so supportive in one way or other in different ways. And I'm so grateful for that. And my family, I spoke to them as well, and they are like, Lillian, you are a very peaceful person. Just do the best that you can, and just be happy with your son. Just move out, and just let them be. You help them, and you'll be proud of that. And God will be happy that you help people. And as I'm sitting here, I'm just so thankful that my faith has made me to be where I am today. And get the blessing that I had, live away from that house. As I move from that house to where I am now, I just got a new job, a promotion at work, that I just started two weeks ago and I'm so happy having a new house, new promotion, so peaceful. We pray, we sing praises, we know distraction, nothing, and we are so happy. I'm so happy to share my testimony with you guys. And I pray and God has given me that spirit and heart to forgive those people for what they did to me. And uh, it's important to forgive. But I'm still praying for God to take away all that pain away. The forgiveness is taken bit by bit. The pain has completely gone. I'm now very peaceful. But uh, for the forgiveness, I'm forgiving them. 
it's a step-by-step -step process. And God is going to help me to forgive them fully. And I'm so thankful because of my faith. And there's nothing that God will not do if you ask him to do. And there's certain things that happen to you for a reason. God has something that he has planned for us. And I think God planned it that I need a beautiful place. This is very beautiful, even more than my old, old place. I've got transport system close to me. I've got the church Lincoln the chapel. I've got the shopping center to go to my son's school. Everything is just close by family and friends. So I'm saying, just want to say, God is wonderful. God has been faithful. We should not relent on our faith. Thank you. That is my testimony.
of all blessing and honor and glory. Is he worthy of this? He is. Well, hello. Welcome to our Sunday online meeting for the 2nd of October 2022. Different situation, I'm not home, I'm actually in the chapel, standing instead of sitting, not that that makes any particular difference, but uh, that's just convenient for the moment. The impossible is possible with God. Now, what I'm gonna say is fairly wide ranging. I'm gonna look at the context of those words of the Lord Jesus, but then extend it. Uh, beyond them. Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men, with people, are possible with God. He was talking about the rich young ruler that had had the opportunity to follow him and didn't. That was read to us. I'm going to refer to that a little bit as we go on. He was told by Jesus that he had to sell everything he had, a very unusual request. That's not normal. But in his case, that was essential. And sometimes there is some particular thing that the Lord puts his finger on for you. This you must do if you're going to follow me. But with God's help, he could have done it. Um, I'm going to read you verses 22 to 27 of Luke chapter 18, which is where uh, our reading was from. Um, when Jesus heard these things, the way he'd interacted with the rich young ruler uh, up to that point. I'm not gonna say what he said because I'll do that a little bit later. He said, yet you lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he was very sorrowful. He wanted to follow Christ, but not as much as he wanted to hang on to his riches, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he didn't try to call him back, he just used what had happened as a, as, a, as a lesson to others. What a solemn thing, that all you are is a lesson to others not to be like you or him in this case. When Jesus saw that, that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Really hard. They're kind of caught up with the riches. They become materialistic. It's hard for them to change. For it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it, his disciples especially, said, well, who can be saved? If you're rich, surely that's a, the sign that God is blessing you. Uh, yes and no. Won't go into that, but it's definitely not in the New Testament time we're in now necessarily at all a sign that God is blessing you. It just is not the case. But they said, who then can be saved? If he can't be, then Jesus answered, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God for him for you. That's what I want to be talking about. In other words, whatever may be at the moment holding you back from following Christ, becoming a Christian, embracing eternal life, entering the kingdom of God, living a worthwhile life, having a hope that is eternal, being able to help anyone you meet uh, with, with this wonderful gospel message and so on, having a satisfying worthwhile, the only thing that really is eternally worthwhile, you, I would hope that you would want that, you can have it. Whatever is holding you back from that, with God's help, you can, you can overcome that problem. It doesn't just simply mean that um, God can do everything and we can't, that's obvious. It means I can do everything that God wants me to do with God, with men, myself and other people. It's impossible, but not with God. In a different context, Paul said, I think it's Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Illustration of this, again on the riches materialism line, 
in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and then I'm going to broaden it out a little bit. Uh, I'm going to read you two portions of 1 Timothy chapter 6, both about money. So, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, I think that's the third time I've said that, from verse 9. Paul says, but they that will be rich, not those who are necessarily, but those who want to be, fall into temptation. Not they might, they do. A temptation to do what is wrong. And a snare. Think of a, an animal snare, you know, jack, gotcha. And into many foolish and hurtful desires, which drown men in destruction and ruin. I mean, what a ter terrible um, description or warning. For, Paul says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money is the root of all evil. Money can be used for extreme good. But the love of money, it doesn't mean every single evil that has been perpetrated comes out of that. It means every evil that has been perpetrated could have been and probably has been had the love of money at the root of it. Um, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Those truths which mean we, we receive them and, and Jesus saves us. They, they moved away from it, lost, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Makes you miserable if you want to be rich. But, Paul says, you, O man of God, run away from these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Grab hold of eternal life. And, and, and so on. In other words, the laying aside of the, the love of money means you can grab hold of eternal life. Eternal riches. Riches in heaven. Same thing is really said. Uh, slightly different way. Um, verses 17 to 19. Paul says to Timothy, charge them that are rich in this world, charge them, tell them this is essential for them, those who are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, don't get above yourself, look at me, look at my position, you know, pride comes with it, obviously, uh, nor trust in uncertain riches, that, if it, the situation now in this country, and, and many times in the past, you don't know what's coming, you, well, anyway. Uh, but, don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who you can trust in, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. It all comes from here anyway. And for us to enjoy it, not to abuse it, but to enjoy the things he gives us. That they do good, that they be rich in good works. <laughs> Ready to distribute, willing to communicate, willing to share their riches, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, the eternal realm, that they may lay hold on eternal life. The mean person, Scrooge, does not have eternal life, unless he's changed, as in the Charles Dickens story. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a horrible thing to be stuck in that way and to change. Well, who can be saved? Who can change? Who? With men, it's impossible. We can't change ourselves. There's this selfishness, this greed, covetousness, this me, me, me is in us. But with God, it's possible. So I'm going to broaden that out a little bit. Firstly, with a reference to um, something in the story of the rich young ruler. This is the earlier part of the story that I didn't mention just now. I'm going to, six things, but don't worry, I'm going to only briefly talk about them. And I'm going to talk about letting go and grabbing hold of the things about, you know, God. Let the materialism or whatever is the problem go with God's help and grab hold of what God has for you, eternal life with God's help and he will help you that's the great thing let go of self-righteousness 
grasp hold of Christ's righteousness. And here I'm going to read to you from uh, the story of the rich young ruler, uh, Luke, Luke chapter 18, from verse 20. Um, just uh, picking up the story. You know the commandments, Jesus said to him. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth up, not perfectly, but he'd made, a per he'd made an attempt to do it. Another account says, Jesus loved him, or kind of had a sort of a sense of, he means this. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, yet you lack one thing. You may have been trying to keep those commands. Sell all that you have. The covetous one has actually got you. You may not realise it, but it has. The last of the ten commandments. Distribute to the poor and you'll have treasures. But in heaven. And come, follow me. <laughs> and you'll have eternal life. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful. For he was very rich and so on uh, there it is paul had a different view uh, i'm going to read you some of you will anticipate this passage um, just a few verses from philippians chapter 3 verses 6 to 9 you see his own attempts at righteousness they'd all failed to a point but this one especially the covetousness one it had got him now, this is what Paul said. This is his old life. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I kept every bit of it morally and the, the, the uh, ceremonial side too and so on. But what things were gained to me, what I thought was very important, I counted loss for Christ. I, I put no value on them at all for Christ. Yes, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but done, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, my attempts to keep the law of God, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith a gift, Christ followed the law perfectly. God's smile, his father's smile was on him. Everything he said and did, he was kind, generous, and so on and so forth. That righteousness is mine as a gift. If I trust Christ, a lot more could be said. Let go of your own attempts. They don't work. You may be very kind. It may be that the Lord is glad to see that you're trying, but don't hang on to that. That does not please him. He'll point out something. It doesn't work here, does it? Don't go away grieved. Wrong religion. Christ's religion. Get rid of the wrong religion. Take Christ's religion. Some people say Christianity isn't a religion. Yes, it is. It's the religion of the Spirit. It's the one that is right in as much as he rose from the dead. That's not bigoted to say. Just a fact. Now, if you're in a certain religion and it's not Christianity, there's a possibility you would face persecution, be ostracised by your family, rejected by them. I mean, in the worst case scenario, death. I mean, that's a horrible thing to think, but it's, it's true. But with God, you can do that. You can be faithful unto death and receive then a crown of life from God. Christ. Sexual impurity to sexual purity. Sounds easy, doesn't it? It sounds as if it's almost the same things. Purity, impurity, it's vastly different. The Bible just says sex is for marriage, not before, not after. And then when you're married, sex with that one person only for life, no one else ever, unless of course the person dies, and so on. The porn industry is enormous, even in countries with a much higher moral standard than ours in sex, sexual ethics, they have huge problems privately with porn, internet and so on. But all adultery, 
homosexuality, paedophilia, whether the, the law frowns on it or the law says it's okay, the law of the land, that is, it's wrong. It's wrong. And it can get hold of you. And it can mould your thinking. And I can see people, and I only think of, of, of them as, as objects, as sex objects. And, and it can dominate, and I can become a total slave. And with men, it's impossible to be any different. But with God, all things are possible. You can be free and pure. Addiction to gambling. Um, it, it, it's a huge problem and an increasing problem, certainly in the West. But to be addicted, maybe we should say devoted to Christ instead. We had a brother in the church here, he's gone to heaven now, Brother Benton. Uh, a number of times he, he tried to give up bad gambling. He was married, he had small children and, and um, you know, he'd make a resolve and then fail and then that sense of horrible guilt went by failing. One of his little boys said to him, I don't know the circumstances under which this happened, but said to him, Jesus loves daddy too. And that was it. He was converted and set free from the addiction of gambling. It doesn't matter what the addiction is, actually. You know, one can think of substances, drugs, uh, cigarettes, tobacco, whatever. It, it, it's got me. Jesus can set you free. It's impossible with men. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous and so on, and that can be a, a great thing. And I'm just a recovering. I'm never free. I just have to consider myself. I'm not drinking at the moment, or I'm not stuck on this addiction at the moment. But he can set you free and give you power. With men, this is impossible. But with God, it is perfectly possible. Some people are addicted to being popular rather than the approval of God. Jesus spoke of the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, said they like the praise of men rather than the praise of God. That's why they don't believe on me. I'm an, uh, you know, what I'm saying is true and they may know it's true, but they want to keep their position because they like the prestige that comes with their position. Some people can't stand being laughed at, being different, being thought odd. They like the praise of their friends, their family, their community, rather than the approval of God. And there is power in the gospel to have such a vision of Christ and who he is and, and how wonderful he is, that this God who became man and is despised and rejected of men, still today, though he is glorified and accepted in heaven, on earth, basically he's rejected. But it's possible for me, with God's help, to accept him and to accept all the popularity, the unpopularity that comes with it. Uh, it, it it's against my nature. People are proud. They want people's approval. They need to have their massages their egos massage, not their massage is ego. Um, but it, you can be set free from that desire to, to follow the Christ who God approves of. Finally, just simply, one gets stuck in one's ways. It's possible to, to, to leave that, that attitude of, oh, I can't change and so on, to what the Bible calls repenting and following Christ. Repent means to change your mind in the light of all that God has said and done in Christ. I can turn from my thinking, my ways that are impure, wrong and my sin to him, to his ways and to the miraculous ability that he has to make me over a period righteous and so on. Something that they say, you know, I can't go against my partner, my job, my situation means I just can't change. Maybe it's just a question of, I've always done it this way. I've always thought this way. Um, it, you, you can't teach a, a, an old dog new tricks. It's, it's too late for me now. It, it, maybe for young people, it, it's all right. Well, young people can be very stuck in their ways, let me tell you. Um, it, oh, it's too much for me to take in. You know, the, the Bible and that, I, I really... One way or another, 
I'm stuck in my ways. I'm in a rut and I cannot get out of it with men. That's the situation. But with God, it is perfectly possible for you to get out of whatever it causes you to be stuck and say, I can't change. You can't, but God can change you. You can change with his help. That is the remarkable thing. With men, it's impossible. But with God, it is possible. That rich young ruler of the story could have had eternal life. He could have had treasures in heaven. He could have followed Christ on earth and then into heaven and then forever and ever following him. But his desire, his inclinations, in his case for the riches, his fears, maybe for the future, what will I do without them? If I sell it or what, what then? Held him back and he was very sorrowful and he went away and he missed it. But he could have followed Christ. So let me finish with an invitation. What uh, the Lord Jesus said to the rich young ruler. Jesus heard these things. He said to him, you lack one thing. One thing is holding you. In his case, sell all that you have. Don't feel you've got to do that unless you're absolutely certain God is telling you that. And distribute to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. <laughs> That's what Jesus says. Come, follow me. Whatever is holding you back, it doesn't need to. Because the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. And if you come to Jesus, God is with you. Praise the Lord. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never failed me You're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness Still in your hands, this is my confidence, you never fail. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you never fail.
gracious God for the truth, this, this wonderful truth. So sad that this man missed it. We don't know if he changed his mind. We are fearful that he didn't. It's a lesson. Help us, Lord, to realise nothing can stop us from following you, laying hold of eternal life, letting go of the things that would destroy us. And no doubt others would come down and be destroyed with us. Lord, we accept you. With you, we can do all that you require, all that's good, all that's right. And we say thank you. We believe you, not ourselves, but we believe you. Thank you that the very truth of your word, the very message, produces that faith in you, in us. Thank you for that. Lord Jesus, we give ourselves now. I give myself to you. Help me. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest on all who have approached the Lord Jesus in this way and with his people everywhere. Amen. Amen.